Hello friends, today is the 49th lecture, one shot of half century, which was started uh, on January 1st and we are slowly moving ahead. Actually, this afternoon I gave this lecture at another webinar uh, in Coimbatore, uh, but uh, there were hardly any audience and I thought everybody was having a good Sunday afternoon nap. And sure enough, in the evening, I had requests, sir, can you please give this talk? Because this current understanding of etiopathogenesis of adenomyosis is a sure shot uh, question in the basic sciences, or it can even come in the recent advances. And I thought um, for the benefit of our PGs, I must take this class. Hence, I quickly scheduled, uh, even though it's a Sunday evening, I canceled my trip to Gangtok, and then I thought uh, I should take this class. So here it is. Um, let's have uh, the class straight away without wasting the time. All of you know that adenomyosis is a disorder in which endometrial glands and stroma both are present within the myometrium. All of us know that. But what is important is that resulting in hypertrophy of the surrounding myometrium it's not just the endometrial gland and stroma that are present in the myometrium that also stimulates the hypertrophy of the surrounding myometrium, something what happens in the leomyoma also. But yet, adenomyosis stands apart from leomyoma. In the sense, in leomyoma, you have a pseudo capsule, but adenomyosis is not bound by any capsule. It spreads its tentacles everywhere. That's why it is much more difficult to treat compared to fibroid either by surgery or by medical management. Women with symptomatic adenomyosis represent uterine enlargement. Whenever we say uterus is enlarged regularly, there are three possibilities. Number one is pregnancy. How do you differentiate? It is regularly enlarged but soft uterus. The second one, regularly enlarged but firm uterus is adenomyosis. Number three, regularly enlarged hard uterus is endometrial cancer. Fibroid is enlarged uterus but typically irregularly enlarged uterus. So apart from enlargement, the other main problem with adenomyosis is abnormal uterine bleeding. And then, of course, the painful menses. Earlier, we thought that adenomyosis is a problem of a multiparous lady. So there is no question of infertility in this. But now we know that adenomyosis is very much there, not only in younger ladies, but even in adolescents. And this, is, this can give rise to infertility as well, about which I'm going to talk in detail in another class, maybe. Consideration of adenomyosis is part of evaluation of these symptoms. So that means whenever you find a enlarged uterus, whenever there is AUB, whenever there is painful menses, dysmenorrhea, in addition to thinking of fibroid uterus, endometriosis, you must always think of adenomyosis. Another myth when I was an undergraduate and postgraduate was that endometriosis and adenomyosis are mutually exclusive. That means they won't coexist. That is another myth that is burst. They can coexist, not only those two, but along with them, fibroid also can be there. So they are all close cousins, or actually they may be siblings. The common underlying problem behind all three of them is hyperestrogenic state. Yet they are slightly different from each other. That is the that is the beauty of it, or what is that? Is the intriguing part of it. So let us look at the epidemiology and risk factors of adenomyosis. The natural history, prevalence, and risk factors of adenomyosis are uncertain. You know why? The definitive diagnosis can only be made on pathology evaluation and typically following hysterectomy. Nobody would like to remove the uterus to confirm whether there is endometrial tissue in the uterine wall when the patient is young. So that's exactly why 
the natural history prevalence and risk factors are a little bit difficult to be sure of. However, adenomyosis has been found in adolescents in studies that use pelvic imaging rather than hysterectomy for diagnosis. So other day while talking about AOB, I told you about eight different findings of MRI or ultrasound. So you don't have to wait for hysterectomy to prove that it is a case of adenomyosis. There are beautiful pictures that we can uh, see in the ultrasound or MRI and we can diagnose adenomyosis even in younger ladies or even adolescents. So the incidence, it is generally estimated that adenomyosis is present in 20 to 35% of women. It's quite high compared to even endometriosis and even fibroids. In fact, one of the studies said the incidence was 65% because of meticulous histopathological analysis of multiple myometrial sections. So the more number of sections you do somewhere in the uterus, you may find some adenomatic patches. So this particular study, though it's a very old study, 1974 study that said endometriosis is 65%. I think that's little too much. Adenomyosis appears to be more common in paras than early paras women. This was obviously the thought during my PG days as well as later uh, when I was junior staff. But we now know that greater number of pregnancies are not associated with higher risk of disease, right? So that doesn't mean that you have to have a Paris lady. Uh, you know, you can actually have a young lady without any pregnancy and still there can be adenomyosis or other way around. Just because you have had two, three kids doesn't mean that you cannot have adenomyosis or you should have adenomyosis. So adenomyosis is sort of independent of parity. That's what these two sentences say. Another interesting fact is that situation is just the opposite in women with leomyomas, in whom parity is associated with decreased risk of disease. We always say um, fibroids are more common in nulliparous or those who have got low parity. But Adenomyosis can be there in low parity, in high parity, in anybody and everybody. That's what we should be aware of. Adenomyosis is often, as I already mentioned, coexists with other uterine diseases, primarily uterine leiomyomas and endometriosis. This makes it difficult to determine whether adenomyosis has unique risk factors or even how it behaves as a disease because it is always overlapping with leomyomas and endometriosis. So nobody knows exactly what is the typical uh, feature or unique feature risk factor for adenomyosis. As I told you, behind all three of them, there is hyperestrogenism. All three of them will have dysmenorrhea. All three of them will have some amount of AUB and all three of them can have infertility. So the unique nature of adenomyosis is very difficult to make out. But of course, fibroid uterus, we can make out and the endometriosis, we can make out. As an example, persistence of pelvic pain following optimal endometriotic surgery may be confounded by presence of adenomyosis. What it means is that let's say you have done a fantastic surgery for endometriosis. You have removed all the chocolate cysts. You have removed uh, all the additions and you have nicely cauterized or fulgurated all the endometriotic patches. Still the patient may persist with the pain. And what's the cause of that? Adenomyosis, which you have not tackled. Nobody removes the uterus just like that for endometriosis, unless in the very elderly age group, you may do an n mass THBSO. In a younger patients, we simply come off after doing a chocolate cystectomy, adenolysis and things like that. So since uterus is left behind and adenomyosis is there in the uterus, the patient may still feel pain. Studies have shown that compared with women with endometriosis, women with adenomyosis were younger. So the myth is totally burst. She need not be elderly and parous. They were younger. Had early menarche, that means a long duration of estrogen exposure. 
and shorter menstrual cycles. Again, what does shorter menstrual cycle means? Always the cycle length is shorter or longer depending upon uh, the first half of it. Usually the second half is constant, right? And there can be dysmenorrhea. There were, they had dysmenorrhea and pelvic pain and depression. I will connect the depression with adenomyosis maybe in the subsequent slide or later, but this is the characteristic of adenomyosis. They were multiparous also. Again, they were younger as well as they were multiparous, both, and had history of prior uterine surgery. Maybe I will, when I talk about the theory of etiopathogenesis, the endometriotic seeds are sown when you do a surgery on the uterus. Maybe when you cut the uterus for a myomectomy or for a caesarean section. So without your knowledge, you may be just sowing some amount of endometrium into the myometrium. So one half of the women in both groups, that is endometriosis and adenomyosis, had concomitant leomimus. Again, proving that all three of them are inseparable cousins, siblings, friends, or whatever you say. A large population-based study reported that adenomyosis is associated with an increased risk of both endometrial and thyroid cancer with hazard ratios of 2.19 and 1.7 respectively. So this is a very important slide and statement. What it means is that, you know, it, for a long time, there was a debate where to place this endometriosis, whether it is a infection, whether it is cancer, because it shows some nature of the cancer. What is that? One of the theories behind endometriosis is metastatic theory. That means from one place, the cells migrate to another place, either through vascular channels or through lymphatic channels, and they get established there and they grow there. So that nature is of cancer. But how does endometriosis and even adenomyosis differ from cancer is that they do grow in a new place, but the growth is still controlled. It's not bizarre. It's not haphazard. It's not unchecked. So that way they are different. However, look at this statement. They were associated with an increased risk of both endometrial and thyroid cancer. Somewhere the genetic predisposition may be there, which is common or sharing with endometrial cancer as well as adenomyosis, endometriosis, and even fibroid uterus. This study was published in PLOS, and all of you know that PLOS is a very high impact journal. So now I turn my attention towards histopathology. That is very, very important. The pathognomonic feature of adenomyosis is presence of endometrial tissue within the myometrium at a distance of at least one low power field. This is very important. It's not just beneath the endometrial cavity. Some insist even two low power fields from the endomyometrial junction. This is very important. A prior history of endometrial ablation could confound the diagnosis of adenomyosis as the procedure distorts the whole situation that endomyometrial junction or even destroys the endometrial myometrial junction. So there has to be a clear gap between the endomyometrial junction and the endometriotic tissue. Then only it is adenomyosis. The ectopic endometrium usually has an immature proliferative pattern. That is the thing. That is exactly why the adenomyosis is not very well responsive to the hormones that we give. For the progesterone to act, it has to be a nicely well proliferated endometrium with a good estrogenic you know, stimuli. Otherwise, the progesterone will not act that well. That's exactly why no matter what you give, whether you give progesterone, danosol, GnRH analogs, none of the medical management is very effective against adenomyosis. This is the main thing that you have to understand. It is an immature proliferative endometrium, which does not respond well to progesterone or progestogens. What are the histopathological types? 
there are different types. Number one is diffuse adenomyosis. Gross section, you will see uniformly enlarged and boggy uterus, 80 to 200 grams. Whereas on sections, you will see myometrial wall thickened and often contains small hemorrhagic or chocolate colored areas representing islands of endometrial bleeding. They also bleed and that get collected in the myometrium itself. That's why in the ultrasound, you see like see things like lakes. Then there is focal adenomyosis, which is also called adenomyoma. Adenomyoma, but the difference between leomyoma and adenomyoma is that leomyoma has got a pseudocapsule, adenomyoma does not have, and it contains glandular tissue. Adenome means glandular tissue rather than just the fibrous tissue. So gross, it resembles a fibroid, but without a pseudocapsule. Then there is cystic adenomyosis. Cystic is in the inverted comma because you think that it is a cyst, but then it's almost like a diffuse adenomyosis, or it could be even adenomyoma, for which cysts of more than one centimeter in diameter are seen on imaging studies. So on imaging, you may see that there is actually a cyst there, lakes what we uh, describe usually, and that can be sometimes called cystic adenomyosis, but it is actually a diffuse or a adenomyoma only. Juvenile cystic adenomyoma, if you see these kind of things in uh, younger ladies, a syndrome in which women 30 years or younger with severe dysmenorrhea and have myometrial cysts more than one centimeter, sometimes you call it juvenile cystic adenoma. However, Cystic adenomyosis has been reported in women of a variety of reproductive age groups, including more than 30 years. Now I come to all important pathogenesis. What is the etiopathogenesis of adenomyosis? Well, like endometriosis, we do not know the exact cause or exact etiology of adenomyosis. So when we do not know the exact cause, it will be only theories. Like you have different theories in endometriosis, the theory of retrograde menstruation, the theory of metaplasia, theory of metastasis, whether it is lymphatic or the vascular metastasis, and then totally theory of you know, immunological theory, and then the hormonal theory. Similarly, adenomyosis has got two main theories. Number one is it develops from endometrial invagination instead of implantation. So implantation theory is nothing but the retrograde menstruation, wherein the endometriotic tissue is sprayed onto different parts in the pelvis, starting from ovary to the uterosacrals to the peritoneal, whole peritoneal layers. Whereas here, it is not like that. It is invagination. It goes inside into the endometrium. Number two is de novo Mullerian rest, something like metaplastic serosal metaplasia theory of endometriosis here also the Mullerian tissue probably has some the capacity to you know, transform itself into endometrial tissue. Uh, and that's called de novo Mullerian res. So let us see how these theories are supported. The invagination theory supported by a mouse model of adenomyosis and molecular studies, which supported invagination hypothesis facilitated by weakness of degenerating uterine smooth muscle tissue. When I was UG, our teacher told me it is very common in multiparous ladies because after subsequent preg um, successive pregnancies, the myometrium, actually there is a breach in the basal layer. Through that breach, the endometrial tissues will percolate like that. But now we know that it is not actually the breach or something like that, but it is due to the weakness of degenerating uterine smooth muscle tissue. Whether the person becomes pregnant or not, this can happen. So that is, this is the invagination hypothesis. Whereas the other one is, which supports metaplastic process, appears to be more likely given a report of adenomyosis in a woman, woman with Rockintoski kostner hosner syndrome, that is RKH syndrome, who lacked utopic endometrium. Now, how do you explain this? This lady with RKH syndrome, we usually say that means there is no uterus, only very small uterine bud will be there. So when there is no uterus, there is no uterine cavity, but yet that whatever small bud had some endometriotic tissue in its wall, 
So how do you explain that? You can explain that only through a metaplastic process theory. So thus, both the theories are supported. One is invagination theory, other one is metaplastic process, de novo Mullerian rest. There's also something called molecular expression theory in the sense there is an increasing molecular evidence that the adenomatic glands differ in expression of key molecules from utopic endometrial glands. This is not the theory of origin, but this particular thing explains that this endometriotic tissue, which is there in the myometrium, is different from the utopic. Utopic means the one which is there in the uterine cavity, in the right place. Ectopic means outside, utopic means inside. So that is exactly why probably this particular endometriotic tissue, though it is endometriotic tissue, but because it has got a different molecular expression, it is not easily destroyed or killed by the drugs that we give from outside. Whether you give progesterone, very, very strong progesterone, norethisterone acetate, or you give dinogest, or you give any other drugs, dinosol or GnRH analog, very difficult to tackle this particular uh, endometriotic tissue. There is something called junctional zone. You know that junctional zone of myometrium may play a key role in this disease. Probably everything is supported or supplied from that zone. The junctional zone is a region appearing as a dark band on titivated MRI that separates the subendometrial myometrium subendometrial myometrium from the other or outer endometrium, but cannot be identified histologically. <coughs> this is seen only in the t 2 weighted MRI. Studies show that this region has ultrastructural changes and differential growth factor expression that may influence the physiology of adenomyces. So because this particular region has got specialized cells, which may actually turn themselves into adenomyotic cells and they have a different expression and they are supported by different growth factor. So that's the thing. Now, whatever may be your theory, finally, there has to be a hormonal theory. What do you mean by this? Whether the endometrial tissue is implanted from retrograde menstruation or it is invaginated from the endometrial cavity into the myometrium, whatever it is, it needs manure, it needs watering, it needs hormone to grow. And which is the hormone that will support the endometrium? It is estrogen, right? So even progesterone is required. We know that the final part of the maturation is by the progesterone secretory endometrium, but that is the one which will decrease the amount of you know, the growth. And finally, when it is withdrawn, it will uh, be shed. So estrogen and progesterone appear to play a role in adenomyces pathophysiology as they do in other gynecological disorders. This is primarily inferred from the response of symptoms to steroidal treatments. That means when we give progesterone, definitely some amount of regression of adenomyces is seen. That's why it is believed that estrogen is probably supporting the adenomyces. That's the theory. So there are studies that suggest that estrogen is produced in adenomyotic tissue. Now watch this word. Estrogen is produced in adenomyotic tissue. All this while, we were all talking about estrogen being produced in granulosa cells, two cell and two, uh, two granulotrophin theory. Yes, that's true. That is the main supply. That's the main source. But here you can see the adenomatic tissue itself produces its own manure. What is that? Estrogen. So in vitro studies that suggest that there is aromatase in the endometrium. Aromatase enzyme is the one which converts now, aromatase inhibitors are the ones which are used you know, to get more of it. So the aromatase endometrium of women with adenomyces is normalized by GnRH analog and dinosaur treatment. So aromatase enzymes are very much. So aromatization is a process wherein androgens are converted into estrogens. So that is there in the myometrium of the patients with adenomyces. So both estrogen is there and aromatase enzymes are there. 
but not studies of direct action on adenomatic implants. So this is to be proved in uh, on directly on the adenomatic implants. Finally, we can say that murine model of adenomyosis suggests that early exposure to estrogen. That's exactly where we saw in the younger ladies in epidemiology, we saw that, and in the ladies who had early menarche and for a long time led to an increased risk of adenomyosis and abnormal myometrium which also supports the invagination hypothesis. So it is estrogen, estrogen, and estrogen, which is the common factor behind endometriosis, fibroid uterus, and adenomyosis. In addition to that, adenomatic tissues can produce their own estrogen through the aromatase enzymes that, they are, that are present there. Not only these hormones, estrogen, progesterone, prolactin, FSH, oxytocin, they are also very, very important. Other animal models suggest that pituitary protein hormones, including prolactin, FSH, and oxytocin, which have direct uterine effects, may also have roles in pathogenesis of this disorder. How many studies are there? Seven studies are there to prove this. Prolactin, both direct exposure of the uterus to prolactin and hyperprolactinemia secondary to SSRI. Where do you use SSRI? In depression. I told you I will connect the depression and adenomyosis few, few minutes ago. Now you can see the connection. So SSRI use appear to capable of inducing uterine adenomyosis. This hypothesis is strengthened by research showing both depression and antidepressant use are increased in women with adenomyosis and there is some treatment response to dopamine agonist. So it's a fantastic proof. Those ladies who are depressed will develop adenomyosis because of depression itself, because whenever there is decrease in the uh, uh, dopamine levels and increase in the hyperprolactinemia, depression is bound to occur. And number one. Number two, when these ladies are given antidepressants, that also will increase. And when they are given dopamine agonists to negate this, then also they found some relief from the adenomyosis. So three-pronged proof. One is depression, antidepressants will increase adenomyosis. When you give dopamine agonist, that will be decreased. So we are now using dopamine agonist in endometriosis also, if you recall, cabagolin is used. However, this association could be a result of chronic pain as well. So it has to be proved in more studies. Then comes GF that is growth factor and angiogenesis. Whether it is endometriosis, whether it is cancer, whether it is adenomyosis, whatever it is, finally you require blood supply for its growth. So blood supply means neoangiogenesis and there has to be growth factor. So it is now actually very easy for all of us. We need not be any groundbreaking scientists or anything like that. By common sense, for anything to grow, you know, you require a supply that is a blood supply. So angiogenesis and you require hormones for its growth. Hormones are nothing but proteins, finally, or steroids, right? So you need them for their growth. So this theory says there is some evidence that adenomyces and leomyomas share elements of pathogenesis such as growth factor, dysregulation, and abnormalities of angiogenesis six papers to support that, including one uh, published in PLOS. In model systems, the efficacy of some conventional and investigational therapies may be mediated through these. So in the studies, the further two studies, which I put seven and eight, there they did some manipulation through this, you know, maybe suppressing anti-angiogenic factors they gave, anti-growth factors they gave, and they saw the regression of adenomyces. So that's a wonderful research that is going on, both in endometriosis as well as in adenomyces. So when I talk about endometriosis, these are the same theories which has been extrapolated to adenomyces. The only difference being in adenomyces, the endometrium is slightly special endometrium, is a different endometrium. Whereas when it is uh, endometriosis, it is the same endometrium almost at, that you see in case of the uterine cavity. So adenomyosis, endometriosis, now I pitch one against another. Let us see. Although adenomyosis and endometriosis both represent disorder of ectopic endometrium, 
and can cause pelvic pain. The two diseases are not thought to be otherwise related. So one is directly spray of endometrial tissue from the uterine cavity onto somebody else, some other surface, whereas the other endometrium is directly made mostly from de novo or invaginated from a specialized endometrial junction. It may not be the exact endometrium of the uterine cavity. Yet to find out what is the truth. I'm not saying I've understood this completely. Research is still going on. And, but definitely these two are different. While endometriosis beautifully responds to Dynagest or any other progesterone, Dynazol or GNR channel lock, adenomyosis does not respond that well. Ultimate treatment for adenomyosis has to be surgery. The question is whether the patient is young or old. Younger patients, conservative surgery like adenomyomectomy only can be done, whereas in older patients, hysterectomy is the best thing to do. Whereas for endometriosis, hysterectomy is not done. And unless you do that, patient's pain is not subsided. So they are cousins, they are friends, they are siblings, but they are different. Something like the five children of the same parents are different. Five fingers are different. So adenomyosis and infertility, let's see, adenomyosis is found in a significant number of women with infertility, and it has negative impact on outcome of IVF. Why there is infertility? It may be because of alterations in myometrium and junctional zone. Structural and functional defects leading to altered receptivity in the utopic endometrium. Though the problem is in the myometrium, this can have a damage, damaging effect on the utopic endometrium in structure as well as its function. Dysregulation of myometrial architecture and function. So you should have a beautiful myometrium for the uterus to nicely uh, grow, get implanted. The embryo should get implanted. After all, in the initial stages, it will get implanted almost into the myometrium, let's say, at least up till the uh, zone, and then it grows inside the cavity. Ectopic endometrial glands can trigger an inflammatory reaction. That's why there is, you know, uh, surrounding area, there is hypertrophy of the myometrium. And this inflammatory reaction is not good for the embryo to get implanted and grow. And finally, there is implantation failure. There is also sometimes a uh, failure of the fertilization. Let's see why that is. The failure of fertilization is mainly because there is increased nitric oxide synthase activity throughout the cycle whenever there's adenomyosis. And this is toxic to sperms as well as embryo. So there will be both failure of fertilization, and in case it occurs, there'll be failure of implantation. So either way, there'll be a problem. I hope I gave an overview of the etiopathogenesis, risk factors, epidemiology, and histopathology, pathology of adenomyosis, and you'll be able to write a good answer in the exams. I'll come up with one more topic tomorrow. The, tomorrow's will be the 50th class. Let's see. Thank you very much for your cooperation and, uh, uh, you know, patronage. Let's meet tomorrow. Thank you very much.